Polyglot Conference. Welcome to my talk, Schools Out for COVID. How can we, the online language learning and polyglot community, support online schooling? Please do send me your questions and comments. I think I'll have a chance to reply later in a video, hopefully. First, a little bit about me. My name is Tracy Mihok. I'm from the United States. I've lived and worked in China and also in the United Arab Emirates, and I am fascinated by educational experience. Most of my work has been with startups and with education companies. Um, for my own experience, I was an individual tutor in the United States, and in China, I started classroom teaching. Uh, I also moved to online teaching and community management on italki. And most recently, I was a product manager at an ed tech company in the United Arab Emirates. I am now back in the United States, recording to you from Portland, Oregon. And uh, actually, where were you in March of 2020? I was visiting the United States, where I got stuck because the borders closed and I could not go back to the United Arab Emirates. Uh, so that's where I am now. I'm sure that all of us have our own stories of where we were and what was happening in the spring of 2020. And I'd like to share this map that I got from the UNESCO website. So just pausing briefly here um, to explain the colors. This map shows school closures by country all around the world. So blue, as you can see here in February of 2020, means that these schools are fully open. Um, right now, you can see that China is partly open, partly closed, partly open. Um, and it is pink in color and Mongolia is fully closed due to COVID-19. And let's just watch what happens as we leave February and enter the month of March. All right, here we go. So end of February, early March, more and more countries are becoming affected. Um, a lot of situations, the schools are closing very suddenly. Teachers and students had very little warning. Ed tech companies are scrambling to keep up with demand and scrambling to change their products and services. These uh, dark blue colors represent some kind of an academic break, like a spring break that's going on. Okay, now we're, we're into April and you can see almost every country in the world has been affected in some way. Uh, these numbers down here, we can see that more than 1 billion learners have been affected. Uh, and that doesn't even include the number of parents and teachers that, of course, go along with all of those learners. I'll stop the map here. Uh, so in addition to UNESCO, a lot of my research for this talk came from this report by EdSurge. EdSurge is an educational news and research organization in the United States. It's mostly focused on the United States education, but a lot of the results and a lot of the conclusions of this report, I think, will apply to a lot of other places as well. So EdSurge noticed that we see an urgent need to support and extend collaborations between researchers and educators. Also, researchers, educators, and the media can provide schools and districts with examples of research-backed approaches to meet this moment. What's happening here is a lot of schools are having to change so quickly that they don't necessarily have specific research that applies to this situation, and they're looking for support in helping them understand how to change and how to adapt in ways that will continue supporting students' education. Uh, EdSearch also invited that ed tech companies should be part of this effort. And I think that actually the online learning and teaching community could be a huge part of this. Um, the reason for that is even if we're not necessarily professional researchers or have published research, there is within this community, there is there are years, there is over a decade of experience and familiarity in a lot of things that are very relevant and very important at this time. So that includes online learning tools and experiences, which we've been playing with and experimenting with for years, developing our own teaching and learning methods, uh, connecting people remotely. So I used to be the weird one trying to get my friends to join me on Skype because they lived in different time zones or different countries. And now this is common for everybody, catching up with their friends on Zoom, even if they don't live very far away in the real world. Uh, multilingual communication and inclusion is something that a lot of school systems seem to be struggling with now, but something that I imagine a lot of people in this community are actually fairly familiar with. Uh, motivation, purpose, and interest. Uh, we see blogs and videos all the time about 
teachers and students um, finding ways of motivating themselves or motivating their students to continue their language studies. So this is something that I think we also have a lot of experience and familiarity with. And of course, always important that curiosity towards learning new and different things from different people, different languages, different cultures. <laughs> so uh, I want you <laughs> to support school systems. I, I think that there's a lot of really valuable knowledge that we have in this community that could really do a lot of positive good. Um, so I hope that we can, what I'm hoping to inspire you about in this talk is to think of ways that the things that you are already familiar with or that you're already comfortable with about online communication and learning could be used to support school efforts and the work of school teachers and kids still in school. All right, so with that, let's talk about some of the, um, some of the main issues that are happening or, or that are being faced because of school closures. So obviously just shifting to those tech and online environments is a huge deal for schools right now. Um, you know, anytime that teachers have to completely rework their lesson plans, that's a lot of work for them. So imagine doing that, but now changing all of your, your in-person and offline experiences and having to anticipate how to reproduce those similar experiences in an online environment. Even for teachers and schools that were already using some form of, of um, technology or digital media inside the classroom, they're now having to manage everything remotely and online. And as they're doing that, they're having to adapt the learning experience for their classes. So not just individual or one-on-one -on -one classes, of course, but for whole classes altogether, they're having to figure out how to maintain those quality relationships um, between the teacher and the student, but also between the students and each other because group work and group learning is such an important part of a school experience. They're looking for ways of continuing the social and emotional learning that those students were doing and collaborative learning processes. Now, the good news here is that as teachers are learning more and getting more experience using these online tools, they're also noticing ways that those tools can help them support social and emotional learning and collaborative learning for students. But there's still ways to go to get familiar with that and to get tools that are specifically designed for it. Okay, some things I'm really excited about are what new possibilities might come out of all of these changes and all this situation. Um, one of the things that is happening is there are new teacher roles being developed. So uh, I was talking with a teacher in California who told me about academic support teacher roles being created. Basically, these are trained teachers who are supporting other teachers in their classroom work, you know, helping to do some of that technology troubleshooting, some of the administrative work of setting up sessions for students. And the reason I'm excited about this is because I think that this could help support a lot of um, very qualified and well-trained teachers in getting more into technology, product education, technology services. I think we really need a lot of more of their expertise um, you know, as those products and services are being designed. And I hope that this would set up a future where more people are both qualified and comfortable being able to do that. Uh, another thing that's coming out of this are learning pods. So a learning pod is um, a group of families that get together and decide that they're going to share an environment for their students to learn. It's kind of like creating a little mini school uh, where their students can do their online homework together um, in a, a safer environment than going to school where they're contacting all of the students. There's a lot of uh, difficulties associated with learning pods. Some families um, just don't have the bandwidth to support them or they don't have enough money or they don't live in a neighborhood where it's possible. But the fact that people are trying things out like this, I think is interesting to see how, how we develop our understanding about new ways of doing community and neighborhood learning. Uh, another really interesting thing is that because um, because students can't necessarily meet in school and because not all students have reliable Wi-Fi connections. Uh, I've seen some articles where schools are looking for ways of broadcasting media to their students in other ways, for example, a TV show or maybe a radio program. So I think there could be some really interesting new like mass education uh, channels that come out of this. All right, moving to point two, uh, aside from the shift to online instruction, Schools themselves are about much more than just instruction. When a neighborhood loses a school, it's also losing public services that were offered through that school. Um, for many students, that was where they could get reliable meals. 
that was where they had a social environment and a safe space while their parents were away at work. Some of those students are now home alone. And uh, unfortunately, there's also been an increase in domestic abuse cases as people are having to stay home and stay put. So, so schools provide a lot more than just instruction. And um, you know, where, where will those services come through if not the schools? Uh, point number three, an obligation that schools have that doesn't really exist in the same way in a lot of online companies um, or online education companies is that they really have uh, an obligation to support all students. I've made a list here of some of the types of students that were listed as being sort of the most negatively affected or the most at risk because of these changes. So those would include ELLs, which stands for English Language Learner. Um, that would mean, you know, especially in the United States, the media of instruction is pretty much all English. And so sometimes students are in classes where they're learning in English, even though they are not, um, you know, they're maybe not fluent in English yet. And that can pose some pretty big problems for those students and also for their teachers. Aside from them, special needs students require particular instruction so that they also can access education in the same way that other students can. Uh, and students from low income families or families where the parents can't work from home are also, um, you know, need, need especially larger amounts of support. And this was all true before COVID happened. These were all um, inequities that already existed. But as people are trying to move onto online platforms, um, you know, these are some particular situations that continue to stand out as areas where moving to online is not solving these problems. And I wanted to highlight in particular English language learners because I think that as a community of people who are learning and teaching other languages, um, I expect that a lot of us probably have experiences living and working in multilingual or multicultural settings. And so we might be familiar with a lot of ways of communicating with and relating to people that, um, that you know, a lot of teachers or schools maybe aren't just really used to yet. So it's more familiar to us. Perhaps we'd have some um, uh, some good ideas around those areas. All right, and motivation, interest, and curiosity. Uh, another difference between online and like most school education is that a lot of online learners are there because they want to be there, whereas um, a lot of school kids don't really have the choice to go to school or not. Uh, it's you know it's required versus something that's chosen. So when all of the students are staying home and have the option to attend online or to turn off their computers, how do you, how can teachers keep those students motivated? Um, one of the quotes here from the Ed Surge report is that now more than ever, students will need intrinsic motivation, perseverance, and curiosity if they are to succeed. And that brings me to a very interesting, um, very interesting concept from positive psychology. So. This is really exciting to me because I think it's something that a lot of us will probably be very familiar with. As I describe it, I'm, I'm quite sure that, um, that you'll already feel familiar with it. And it's exciting because it's something that's recognized in the scientific research of psychology now. So what I'm gonna to talk to, about, to us about is the four phase model of interest development. Uh, in the first phase, there, we have the learner here, and something interesting has happened in their environment. Maybe something they've never seen before, or something that like reminds them of something, but they don't really know what it is. And then we move to phase two of interest development. If that thing continues to appear in the environment, um, maybe the person sees some information about it where they can engage with that information, they can learn something more, but it's still something very external to them. In stage three, Perhaps the person has seen this enough that they're starting to wonder about it even when it's not there, or they're starting to ask their own questions about it, but they might not really know how to find the answers to those questions. And in stage four, the person has become both more familiar with it and also uh, internalized their curiosity about it. So not only can they ask their own questions about it, but they can also more confidently navigate towards answers to those questions. Uh, as sort of a general category here, we watch the progress from phase one to phase four, 
as moving from like an environmental stimulus that the person is seeing in the world around them to an internalized stimulus where even if it does not exist in the world around them, that person sort of has it inside and can be curious and explore it and find ways to learn more. It's not necessary to have a teacher for these phases of development, of course. I'm sure many of us have done it on our own, but it can be really helpful to have a teacher that sort of guides the student from noticing the thing to being curious about the thing or beginning to be curious about it to understanding how to, um, how to research and seek and find their own answers to that thing. So coming back to this quote from Ed Surge, uh, now more than ever, students will need intrinsic motivation, perseverance and curiosity if they are to succeed. I think a really relevant question here is as the learning environment itself is changing, how will students get those new and interesting things coming into their world so that they can notice them and they can be curious and interested about them? Or as we move environments, what kind of things are already in those new places, those new situations that students will feel familiar with? I think this is an especially interesting question now, given that so many of the world's borders have closed and travel is restricted due to coronavirus. Students are staying home. People are not meeting each other in the ways that they used to. And so this could be very, I, it seems to me that this could be very limiting in terms of students' abilities to meet and engage with new and different things. So like, how can we, how, how can we create those engaging experiences? And especially for a community like this, um, I'd like to invite us to think of, uh, as students are moving into mixed and online environments, what will be those interesting things that can guide them towards curiosity about different people and different languages and different cultures that give us that ability to more enthusiastically explore the world around us. All right, so just to review, we have on the one side the major issues that are being faced because of school closures. But we have on the other side, a lot of the experience and familiarity of the online learning community. I think that for each one of these huge challenges, there's something that, uh, that, that we could potentially have to say that would help people get through it or help us move into a really, you know, a new and interesting phase of education after all of this. So I really hope that you'll take this talk as inspiration to reach out and listen to school teachers, administrators, parents, students, ed tech companies, researchers. Um, you know, of course, different situations are very different. A lot of schools will be facing much different limitations than what we've often had for our independent online learning and teaching environments. But I think that as we can understand these situations, We'll also have ideas of things that we can offer or things that we can contribute. You know, how, how can our experience and familiarity with online learning support the work that schools and teachers are needing to do now? Uh, I really believe that this community has a lot of value to share. And I hope that this talk has been interesting in, in asking you to think about what things might seem normal to you, but be really, really useful to uh, teachers and students or parents dealing with school closures. And that's the talk. Um, I'd really be glad to hear any thoughts or ideas as you're discussing this with others. If you have any questions, please let me know. I did a lot of research that I wasn't able to represent in this talk, so I'd be glad to talk about it more. Um, thank you very much for tuning in, and a special big thanks to Richard Simcott and Paulina Brenner and all of the other volunteers that made this transition into an online learning experience happen. Uh, thank you so much, and have a great day. Music